Hello everyone, good morning and uh, welcome to the 95th Learn with Lorna. I will do it as I as I always do and wait for a second for people to, to join us as it goes live. Good morning, John. So welcome to this episode of Learn with Lorna. As I say, the 95th episode, it's hard to believe we're fast approaching the 100th. Uh, who would have thought it when we started two years ago? My name, as many of you will know, is uh, Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service has four archive centres across the Highlands in Inverness, Wick, Portree and Fort William that look after the historic records of the Highlands of Scotland. This series of talks, as you will know if you've been with me for the last two years, uh, this series of talks is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and no payment or subscription are required to take part in this, but if you're able to donate then we're very, very uh, grateful for that. Now, this week is a bit of a special one. I can see already uh, P1 at Central Primary are watching, so nice to have you with us, Primary 1. Um, we're continuing our January theme of archiving through the ages. In the first one at, uh, in 2022, I spoke about the history of archiving in Scotland and where, where we've come from, what archives are and what we do. And then last week I spoke about the process of archiving. So how do we get the records and um, what do we do with them and what do we collect now for the future? Well, this week I thought I would continue that theme by trying to tell the story of one institution, one school, and show the way in which its school, its story, can be pieced together using different types of records that have come from different places, come to us in different ways. And how we're trying to capture the present of that institution for the future. So the case study I'm going to look at is Central School, Central Primary School, a school in the middle of Inverness on the west bank of the River Ness, near the Cathedral and Eden Court. Um, as you can see, you can see uh, P2 watching, Jack and Ella watching. Uh, so for those of you who are watching from across the world, and I know we will have people in, in New Zealand and Australia, say hi to the pupils at Central Primary uh, and let them know how far, how far spread people are interested in the story of their school. The school was opened in 1821 in August and making this year from August 2021 to August 2022, it's bicentenary or 200th anniversary year. And that's how I came to be part of researching the school's history. And I'm sure any of the pupils who are watching will know that this is their 200th year because they've been doing a lot in class about this. Now, I came to be involved because Mrs Fraser, Elsa Fraser, who is the current head teacher, contacted me to ask if we had anything about the school and if I could help them to mark their big anniversary year. And it resulted in a, a timeline. There are about 12 pages of this timeline that I ended up putting together. Um, now, of course, the obvious place for me to start looking uh, at a school is in our Highland Council school records. Um, you've heard me speak before, if you've joined me before, about school log books, the diaries kept by the head teacher, the admission registers that record all the pupils who attended. Um, and we hold an extensive record. We hold a lot of those school records. But they only date from the 1890s onwards. So what about the first 70 years of the school? How can we find out about that? Well, the first thing I did was to look on the British Newspaper Archive website. So that's a website of newspapers that have all been digitised and uh, scanned in and you can have a look at all these newspapers. And so I looked on there to see if there was any newspaper that had been written in 1821 that mentioned the school being opened and might tell me a little bit more about who was responsible for it. And one of the first things that I found was immediately really useful. So this is a bit from the Inverness Courier in 1821. And it says, the Society for Educating the Poor of the Highlands have resolved on establishing a central school in Inverness for the purposes of teaching the poor people in the school, uh, in the town, and also for training teachers. 
it says that they appointed Mr Cameron, who was a teacher in Dingwall, to take charge of the Central School. Inverness Central School is expected to contain 500 pupils and they say that it was going to be so important in promoting education in the Highlands and also telling people about the Highlands that, that the people who are writing the newspaper said we don't even have good enough words to talk about how pleased we are that this school is going to be built. And that was in 1820, that article. So that already at that point, the school was planned. Uh, we have information about who the first teacher was, um, about the teaching system they were going to use. But most importantly for me in researching it, it gave me the name of the body who was organising it. So it said that the school was being built by the Society for Educating the Poor in the Highlands, also known as the Inverness Education Society. And that was really useful for me because that made me have somewhere else to go and look for where there might be some information. That society had been started in 1818 and the aim of, of it was to um, communicate moral and religious instruction through schools to the inhabitants of the Highlands. So what that means is, um, for the pupils watching, at, at this time when your school was opened, there was no big system of education. Everyone didn't go to school. Uh, it wasn't just something you automatically did. Um, and so this group of people came together to, to try and make sure that people who didn't have a lot of money could still go to school and could still have an education. Um, and so they, they built schools across the Highlands and they taught subjects such as Gaelic and English and writing and arithmetic. And they also ran some Sunday schools. And your school now, Central Primary, um, is, of course, uh, funded by the Highland Council. It's part of the Highland Council. It's part of the, the local government system. But at, that, at this time, when your school was founded, no system like that existed. And so this society who set up the school asked for people to donate money so that the people of Inverness could go to school. And they asked for subscriptions. They asked for um, people to give them some money to help make sure that uh, people could could attend. And lots of, if again, if you're going back to the adults, if you're an adult watching who has watched many of my talks, you'll recognise many of the names who gave money to Central Primary when it started. The Fraser Titlers are in there, the Baileys are in there, uh, all of the big landed families. And lots of the people who gave money were in India or Jamaica or other countries. But for me, one name immediately stood out to me when I started looking at this. Who's, who's involved in the Society for Educating the Poor? Well, the treasurer was a man called John Fraser, and he was a banker in Inverness. Now, obviously, John Fraser is a very, very common name, but um, I knew it was likely to be another man called John Fraser. Uh, it was as likely to be the same man, sorry, as, as a John Fraser that I already knew, who ran Fraser Timber Merchants Collection in Inverness, uh, in Inverness. So this was a timber and shipping business. They ran that through the 17 and 1800s, but I thought that was probably the same John Fraser because I know from looking in that collection that he was involved in educating children and he was involved in charities and, and helping people who didn't have much money. And so I thought it was probably a good chance it would be the same person. And we have that collection in, in our archive. We have its uh, number D122, the Fraser collection. And so that was where I went next to look at a private business collection to see if I could find out any more about the story of the school. And sure enough, within that collection, I found two bundles of letters talking about the Society for Educating the Poor in the Highlands. And there was a load of stuff in there, a lot of information letters and people applying for jobs and details of um, the people who were giving money to the school and information about all the schools that the society was running in the Highlands, including Central. So that was really exciting. And Central School was established literally as a central school. So it wasn't only central in the town, but it was central to the Society for Educating Poor, they wanted it to be like their main school, their most important school, 
where people could come, teachers could come and learn how to teach at Central and then they would go away to other schools and teach there. So it was a really important school as well. Another newspaper, the, the uh, Inverness Journal, told me that it was scheduled to be opened on the 13th of August, 1821. And this is what the article says. At the quarterly meeting of the Committee of the Education Society, so that means every four times a year, the committee, the group of people would get together and talk about uh, the school, the, what they were doing. And they had a meeting and they say that the central school in Inverness, which is gonna receive 300 pupils, was finished, so the building work had been finished, and the main teacher and the inspector of, of the places was at the meeting. And so the meeting said that the school should open on the 13th of August, 1821, and every attention should be paid to the, the morals of the children and their teaching. So uh, not only did you have to learn Gaelic and English and writing and, uh, and arithmetic, but you had to be, they were going to be taught to be good pupils, so just to be nice and to be kind and respectful. And it said that the school was taught in the summer from nine until 12, and then from two till five. So you would start school at nine in the morning, finish at 12, go for lunch, and then do again two till five o'clock in the afternoon, all the way through all age groups. And then in winter, they would finish a little bit earlier because of course it was dark and there was no electricity. And the meeting also talked about uh, enclosing the school grounds. So they were putting a, a boundary wall around the school to keep it safe. The school, as some of the pupils will know, um, was not then in the location that it is now. So when they're talking about that, they're not talking about the building we know now, but we'll come back to that. So just to put that into context for, for um, people watching who, who find that useful, as I do, just to see a timeline in their head. The year that Central Primary was founded was the same year that John Constable painted the Haywain. It was the same year that the Guardian was founded. King George IV was the king. And locally, it was before the Caledonian Canal was built. It was... Uh, so 10, 20 years before Inverness Castle was built, 50 years before Inverness Cathedral was built, 60 years before the current townhouse was built. So the school has a really long story as part of Inverness. And next time you're walking around all those buildings, you can think if you're a pupil at this school, that your school is much older than most of those things. The first teacher, as that uh, article said, was a man called John Cameron, and he had come from Dingwall School, and he taught at Central from 1821 to 1824. And apparently at that time, there were 641 pupils on the school roll. So I don't know if any of the teachers are currently watching can tell me what the school roll is. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the 200s. Um, when he left, the next person who took the job was a man called Charles Pipton. And he got the job because his brother, John, taught at a similar school in London and he uh, came to Inverness to take the job. He had been born in, uh, on the 23rd of January, 1796. So 226 years ago, Charles Picton was born. And apparently he was an amazing teacher. He was a really good teacher. And it, I found it really amazing to learn that when he came to Central Primary, he had already, at the age of 29, taught in Deptford uh, in the south of England and also had taught in New York uh, for, I think, six years, which I think is quite amazing. And so he came to Inverness in 1824 with his wife, Susanna, and their six children to be the teacher at Central School. And a document in that Fraser collection, the Timber Merchant Collection, tells me that Charles Picton died not long after. He died in 1827 at the age of just 32. And this is what it says. We feel the deepest regret that we have to tell you that Mr. Charles Picton, the respected teacher of Inverness Central School, has died this morning after a short illness and at an early age. Mr. Picton, a native of England, was, before coming to Inverness, 
at the head, the head of a principal school for popular instruction in New York. He was forced by ill health to come away, he needed to come home. And so he taught uh, for a bit in the South and then came up to take charge of Central School. And it says that he looked after 400 pupils. He was the only teacher, 400 pupils. And that he was such a good teacher that people wrote about him in, in books and people wrote about him in newspapers to say that there was this, the, the way he taught and the way the school was run was better than almost any other school in the country. It said that he was a lovely, kind man, a gentle man, and he was very fond of his pupils and his pupils really liked him as well. And so they say that there was, the fact that he has died so suddenly and so young has really upset a lot of people and that his wife has got no money because he was he got such low wages because he wanted to help educate the poor and there wasn't a lot of money. He got such low wages that his wife now had no money at all. And so they were going to raise some money to help her. And they did that. Uh, the community, the school, the pupils, the families raised lots of money for his wife and his six children. And Charles Picton was buried in Inverness's Chapel Yard Cemetery. And his gravestone, which I have, have visited and I'm sure uh, any of you, if you've watched me for any length of time, will know I have a very long suffering partner who constantly has to come with me to do things to do with work and uh, got a message one day saying we need to we need to go to a graveyard when I finish work because I need to go and look at Charles Picton's grave. And as I stood by that grave in Inverness, um, this is what's written on it. To the memory of Charles Picton, late teacher of the Central School Inverness who departed this life on August the 8th, 1827, in the 32nd year of his age. This stone was erected by his most affectionate pupils. And I just thought that was very, very touching. And I know when I told Elsa, the, the head teacher, she also felt that um, how important a teacher can be in the life of, of their pupils. So John Campbell then went on to take the job and he kept it for a few years before John Douglas took over. And John Douglas was one of Central's many long serving teachers, had a lot of teachers who've stayed for a long time. And John Douglas taught at the school for at least 18 years. And he was still there in the 1850s, having seen Central through a really hard time in its history. That Society for Educating the Poor that I mentioned that started the school ran out of money. Um, and they were relying on people giving them money and donating and people just started to find other things to donate to. And so the society uh, ended up folding and, and, and not operating anymore. And as a result of that, Central School was abandoned by them in early 1848. But Mr Douglas, that teacher, struggled on on his own to keep the school open. So he carried on teaching with no wages they let him, when they, the organisation stopped, they allowed him to keep using the building and he had no money coming in, but he tried to keep teaching the children. The building started to fall into disrepair. It was uh, broken down. There were windows broken um, and all sorts of problems with the school. So we leave Central there for just a second because a couple of years earlier, a man called Dr Andrew Bell who was from St Andrews, he was a, a what's called an educationalist, so he was interested in working out ways to, te to best teach children. And he left a very large sum of money to set up and run schools across the whole country, as long as the schools were taught using his own system, which was called the Madras system. And what that meant was that there was one teacher at the top of the school, the teacher would then teach the cleverest pupils, so if there were pupils that were particularly academic and, and um, good at learning, then he would teach them and then they would go and teach the rest of the school. And that was the system uh, that he wanted the schools to be taught in. And so some of this money came to Inverness to set up a school and it was run by a group of trustees. So there was uh, people in the Highlands, a group of men who had this lump sum of money and they could use it 
to put towards uh, schools. Now, originally central school wasn't taught using Dr Bell's method, but when the Society for Educating the Poor went into uh, administration or shut down, Dr Bell said they would step in and help if the school uh, started to fit into their way of teaching. And so they did a report on the school to find out if it was um, something that they should do, that they should take over. And this is a bit from their report. It's absolutely amazing because it tells us the dimensions of the building. It tells us how big it is, how big the land was, tells us about some of the teachers. Um, it says this school building uh, in Queen Street at that point, so near the river, uh, is 75 feet long by 30 feet broad within the walls erected about 30 years ago by the Society for Educating the Poor on a piece of ground measuring 127 feet by 56 feet. The original cost of building the school was £556. So we get this amazing information about the early days of the school. It goes on to describe some of the teachers and says how important Central has been because it's educated thousands of pupils in Inverness. It talks about Mr Douglas and the way he struggled to keep teaching even though there's no money. And in the end, this report says it would be a really good thing for us, the Dr Bell's uh, trustees, to give some of their money and take over Central School so that we can keep educating so many people in the Highlands. And so they concluded uh, that they would take it over and it became a Dr Bell's school in 1849. And also, uh, any of the pupils watching will maybe know we've looked at this on a map, so you can see very clearly on the first edition ordnance survey map where the school is. It's very clearly marked. And we hold some amazing documents from this time when, the, when Central became a Dr Bell's school. We have uh, letters about the school being sold. We have uh, the minutes of the group of people who met, so they would take notes of their meetings, and we have all of those. We have receipts, so we know what teachers were being paid in wages. Uh, we know this, what, how much school supplies were costing. We can see that they were ordering coal for the classroom fires, Bibles and stationery, and that all of those things that were wrong with the school got fixed. So the, the broken windows and the school needed painting and the repairs to the playground, all of that, uh, we can see how much it cost and when it was done. And I know I said, I've said many times over the last two years in this series, but I've said on the week where I was looking at the old high church, that it never ceases to amaze me how much detail we can find out about something like that. We know how much they were paying to fix flood damage at Central School uh, nearly 200 years ago. It's completely uh, amazing. And as I say, Dr Bells agreed to take over this school in a minute dated the 16th of May, 1849. So it's been a Society for Educating the Poor school, then it's been a Dr Bell's school. And then it carries on through the 19th century, so it's the 1800s, um, under this new structure. And by the time we come to the 1872 Education Act, which was a big, big turning point for schools, they had seen three monarchs, they had seen multiple prime ministers. And the head teacher at the time of the Education Act, and I the reason the Education Act meant that instead of having all these different schools taught by different people and different groups, um, they would there would be one system and the schools would come under that. And also it was the first time that you had to go to school. So if you were between the ages of five and 13, this was the first time that you legally had to go to school. And the head teacher at that time was Ronald McDonald. And it was him who also oversaw the school move to its present site uh, on Kenneth Street in Inverness. It opened in 1877 at a cost of £2,350. And again, if you've been watching uh, week in, week out, you'll be sure to know who designed the building. It was, of course, Alexander Ross, the architect. And Ronald McDonald was another of those long serving teachers. He was the head teacher of Central for about 30 years. So at this point in events, when we come to the Education Act, now I go to another series of records to look for the school uh, information about the school. I come to the actual school records in the Highland Council collections. So I said that those only start in the 1890s. So if I had only gone to the education records, we would have missed 
half of that story out because so far in this story we've already looked at newspapers and maps and letters and personal papers and business papers um trustees records and so many different things and it's such a good example this this uh story of central of how the story of a place can be found in so many different places and we hold lots of education records for central we hold uh, lists of pupils who attended, uh, school diaries, um, magazines, rule books, exam papers, prize lists, all sorts of things. And using these, we can learn more about the daily life in the school. So this is George Cameron. George Cameron was the head teacher from 1893 to 1919. He looks a bit strict, I think. Um, and he was the one who was in charge at the time of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Uh, he was one that gave the pupils a week off for that. Uh, I'm not sure Mrs Fraser will be able to authorise a week off for the Platinum Jubilee of the Queen we've got coming up. He also oversaw the extension of the school, so the new building in the, being built for the infants in 1900. And also he was the one who said the school could close for a day in 1902 when Buffalo Bill came to town. He was there when there were epidemics, so sometimes uh, the school had to be closed for measles or scarlet fever. Um, he was there for the coronation of King Edward VIII, uh, Edward VII, sorry, he was the one who let the pupils go and learn about that. And it was also at that time that the school had its first encounter with war. In 1901, one of the teachers, Miss McGilvery, uh, left to go and teach in the concentration camps in South Africa. So the Boer War was happening at this time, and she obviously felt that she could be useful in the concentration camp teaching. And then, of course, World War One came along and that had a huge impact on the school as well. And in Central, one of the ways that the war became very personal was with the loss of a teacher. And if there are any pupils watching, then uh, they'll maybe know uh, a lot about this story because I, I'll come on and tell you why in a second. Andrew Mitchell Bruce, who was uh, one of the staff at the school, left Central on the 16th of March 1916, uh, 1916 to go and serve in the army in the First World War. He was reported missing by June 1917 and the school logbook has all of this written in it, the head teacher at the time was writing about this teacher. And on the 1st of February uh, 19, uh, 1917, the logbook says official notice has now been received from the War Office that Mr Bruce, MA of the staff of this school, has, has died on or after the 23rd of April last. And there's a plaque in the school that tells the story of, of Mr Mitchell Bruce. And the logbook also records that, that before the Easter holidays, the managers came and they unveiled this plaque on the wall uh, to the memory of Mr Mitchell Bruce. And the central pupils last year in November, just passed in Remembrance uh, Day and Armistice Day, went to the War Memorial to look for the name of Mr. Mitchell Bruce and remember him. The next head teacher was this man here. This is uh, William John Shaw, and he had served in the First World War. And his time as head teacher of Central would also cover a period of, of World War. And the central pupils uh, were really active during the Second World War. It's amazing. They did so many things. They knitted clothes for children in other in countries where the Nazi government had uh, the Nazis had had occupied. They had book drives. They raised money for local charities. They collected clothes. They gave their own clothes to send to children in cities in England that had been bombed, like Coventry. And there were loads of evacuees that came to Central as well. It was a huge effort that the pupils put in and the teachers. And it's one that I know the school is still very proud of, uh, that memory. And I wonder if that was perhaps inspired by Mr Shaw, who was the head teacher at the time, because of his time in the army in the First World War, maybe. And the school logbooks give information about all of this. So, for instance, on the 7th of July, 1944, the upper classes knitted 54 vests for the children of occupied Europe to help with the war effort. 
on the 27th of April, as a result of the two weeks book drive, the school collected 22,957 books. Myra Hunter collected 523 herself and 22 others collected 250 books each. So you can see that it's a really huge effort that the school's putting in. In the 90s, 50s and 60s, uh, there was a huge growth in Inverness. Inverness got much, much bigger in the 1950s and 60s. And there were lots of new houses built and new schools built. And Dalney School was one of them, because before that, the pupils at Dalney had also come to Central. It was like an annex school. And this was the man who was head at this time. And I think he's got a lovely, friendly face. What do you think? He looks like such a lovely, friendly man. This is Kenneth Fraser, and he was the head teacher from 1944 to 1962. And lots of the ex pupils that I've spoken to remember either him or his successor, this man here, Mr. Frank Cool, who was the next head teacher. And Frank Cool, this man, carried on that kind of loose connection to the military. He had trained commandos at Achnakari in the Second World War and so continued. Um, reinforcing to the pupils that it was important to support other people and help other people. And we have some great school magazines from this time, from the 1960s. They're full of poems and stories and questionnaires and opinions uh, for both teachers and pupils. One of my favourite ones, if, if I have spoken to you in person about this subject, you'll know one of my favourite ones is uh, the girl who said that her aim in life is to grow up and be a secretary because she wants to wear glasses and she wants a man to tell her what to do. Uh, I'll leave that there for you all to discuss uh, in your own time. But I wanted to read to you one of the extracts from the magazine because I just thought it was really interesting. This is a primary six pupil writing this in the 1960s and it's called Things to Come. What will the world be like in 2066? Will things resemble the TV series Thunderbirds? Or will houses be built of plastic? Will we have colonies on the moon? Houses will probably have movable interior walls. Lighting in the form of electroluminescence will come from the ceiling and you'll be able to alter the colour at the touch of a switch. Heating or cooling, automatic air conditioning and dust extraction will be combined into one compact machine. Power will be dirt cheap, they said. Uh, coming from plutonium operated power plants situated all over the country. Transport will be much better than today in 2066. Cars will be guided along the roads by buried electric cables, a system that they're already testing in America. They will have television and they might run on a cushion of air. Spaceships might not have engines. Space tugs will tow them beyond the gravitational pull of the Earth where they will be released and will set course. There are two main reasons for putting a man on the moon. First, there is the possibility that the moon may have precious minerals. And the second reason is a military one. The moon could be an important rocket base from which rockets could be fired to any part of the world with great accuracy. By 2066, we are sure to have a rocket base on the moon. That's my idea of what the world will look like in 2066. And that was by Leslie Bell in the school magazine. Some of that very, very accurate. And interesting that you can see that's written in the 60s at the height of the space race and uh, all the talks about putting someone on the moon. Moira Hutchin was uh, the head teacher then from 1976 to 1994 and she was the one who was in charge when more renovations and extensions took place and when uh, the Gallic medium unit was opened in 1984. And she was followed by Ishbel Gilroy, who took the school into the new millennium. And so we come to the 21st century and 2022 and the school's 200th anniversary. I'm not going to list the 21st century teachers on here, but if you're there and you're watching, please say hello. Uh, or if you remember them, then please comment. It's been my really great privilege to work with the teachers and the pupils at Central and the current head teacher, uh, Elsa Fraser and the team at Eden Court to mark this anniversary. It's an amazing thing to be part of uh, a 200 year anniversary. And I was delighted to be given this by the school, which is, uh, you probably can't quite read it, but it's a little, um, a little crystal trophy that marks the bicentenary of the school. 
And we've shared with the pupils extracts from all the types of documents I've talked about. Pupils have walked from the original site of the school to the, to the current site. They um, may well go and see Charles Picton's grave. They have remembered teachers and pupils who lost their lives in the First World War and the Second World War. They've learned about the long history of their school and why it's so important. And hopefully they've got some pride and some sense of belonging in that school and why that story matters. And I know that's something that the current teachers really, really care about, that they want the pupils to feel uh, a sense of pride of the in the story of their school and their part in it. One of the things we've done is recorded interviews with uh, and oral history recordings with ex-pupils and ex-staff and created pieces of artwork, pieces of film. Um, and I'm very much going to lay the credit at th for that at Eden Court's door. Um, but I have played a part in that. And all of that will, at the end of this centenary, uh, bicentenary project, this year long celebration, all of that will come to the Highland Archive Centre to add to the collections and the story so that the pupils in the future can learn about it. So we're adding digital recordings, oral, uh, recorded oral to the types of record that we hold about this school. So it's a really good example of the way that the story of an organisation can have can come, can be found in different places. It's been archived in different places, in different ways, in personal papers, in council records, in diaries. And also how you can then unpick that, uncover the story, and then how we can add to that story going forwards. So I hope you have enjoyed finding out a little bit about the story of Central Primary. Thank you so much to the teachers and pupils who've been watching. It's been really lo lovely to have you with us. And thank you to everyone who said where they're watching from so that the pupils can know. Uh, I hope you can join me next week. Next week, I will be looking at the story of our digital archive website, Ambala, and telling you more about that and where that uh, has come from and, and what's on there. But thank you for joining me this week and a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. Thank you so much for joining me.